to week 10 of Get Started in Open Seas with STKO. Today we have a little bit of a double feature life lifetime in the sense that we need a bit more time to explain the theory. Uh, we talk again about the analysis command. Next week, it will be the last one before, let's say it's summer, even if it's already summer. Um, and then next week we will start again at 6 p.m. So we will not need this extra half an hour to be sure to finish on time. And then we will see each other in a month. So see you in September, just make exercises and then we'll see what happens. But we still have another appointment next week and next week to talk about how to bus process your model and to visualize your results. So today of the analysis command, we talk about other things in respect of last week. Last week, we talked about the constraint handler and very uh, a lot of other stuff. Today, we talk about integrator mostly and all of the other setups in the analysis command that we didn't cover last week. Of course, it's a bit of a nerdy class again, and we cannot really explain to you everything that there is to know here, but we can point you in the right direction. Uh, this is always our open seas abstraction to remind ourselves where we are in the open seas world. Uh, today, we just talk about the integrator in the analysis and the analysis model, that, which is the type. Of course, based on the type, the integrator will change. Uh, as you can recall, the analysis command is always the last step of a basic setup of, a, of an analysis in STKO and open seas. Um, we talked about all of this stuff in the middle last week and that today, all the rest. So what is the analysis type? The analysis type constructs the analysis objects. So it's the first thing that you input in the analysis command, and it defines what type of analysis you are going to perform. If it's a static analysis or a transient analysis, there's not much to say about this. Um, I, I'm sure the concept is very clear to everybody. What is a static analysis and what is a transient or dynamic analysis? The only thing that I would like to point out is that Sometimes there's a, a confusion. Here I found the typo, sorry. So sometimes there's a confusion between uh, monotonic and cyclic loading types. So types of loading and types of analysis. These two dif distinctions have nothing to do with each other. So you can use monotonic loading in dynamic analysis or static and cyclic in dynamic analysis or static. You can use both in both types of analysis. The only difference is that when you're doing a dynamic analysis, you will have inertia forces considered in your analysis. So yeah, just remember this. We have some questions on the forum or we get some models that are trying to perform a monotonic cyclic uh, static, for example, experimental test with the, with the transient analysis. Maybe the word transient and cyclic make a little confusion. So just to clarify, there's also another option that you find in OpenSys, which is variable transient, which is used to make a uh, uh, um, uh, variable uh, time step in a, in a dynamic analysis, in a transient analysis in OpenSys. But we don't have this option in, in STKO because we have the adaptive time step, which is a functionality developed inside of STKO to achieve exactly that. So to make an analysis with a variable time step. So. Let's go to the, to the main core of today, the integrator. So the integrator object is what defines how you iterate from one time step to the next time step in your analysis. So it's how the analysis will proceed from one point to the other. Of course, uh, it's a discretization, like we all know that. And this object is actually called sometimes by other, um, like in other mm, fam, uh, theories like the time marching object. So what actually makes the time moves uh, as the analysis gets performed? And it's different, um, it, uh, sorry, it's not different. It changes the way the system of uh, equations of your analysis is like, what's the face of it, how it looks. So there are different types of integrator. And of course, if you do different, if you do static or transit, they will change. There's so many types. So we we're just going to talk about specifically about load control and displacement control and some variations of them. And then in dynamic analysis, central difference and numeric method. The other, these are the most used one for anything that we normally perform in STKO and open seas. Um, of course, if you want to know more about all the others, 
we can point you out at some literature for sure. Uh, so just to start and like get our story straight for everybody, the duration of an analysis is how long it takes to perform it. Um, the number of increments is the number of steps that you need to perform in that duration. And what we call lambda is the load multiplier that we are applying to our loads. So normally the time steps of your analysis are equal the duration divided by the number of increments. In OpenSeas, you're asked to define the time step. In SDKO, you're asked to define the duration. This is just something that we decided to adopt because it was easier for us to program it. There's no difference in it. As you can see, one depends on the other. And how is the load multiplier defined? The load multiplier is a function of the time. If you're doing now, it's just, this is just a little teaser trailer of what's load control and displacement control. Just remind, to remind you, like uh, if the lambda, the load multiplier is a function of time, if I'm doing a load control, then this function of time is the time series, which is a function of time as you define it. Instead, if I'm doing a displacement control, that function is the actual time. So the actual uh, proceeding of time. So the load multiplier will coincide with the time. Maybe this is, a bit, this is a bit confusing, but I'm sure it will be clear later on. Just to remind you a little bit from last, this was from, oh, sorry, there was something written on it. Yeah, from week seven. Um, do you, I don't know if you remember, but just to recall a little bit, time is called pseudo time in open seas, and it has a different meaning if you're doing static or dynamic analysis. So any analysis has to grow monotonically. In dynamic, the time has actually the meaning of real time, but in static, it's something fictitious. It just means that the analysis is proceeding. So let's say in the, dura the duration in a static analysis is just like how long it will take, but not in terms of actual time, uh, but in terms of how many time you, how many in how many steps you want to apply the load that you are applying. Instead, in dynamic, it's just at the actual time that you're using. Static analysis and load control with a linear time series, the time step can be considered as the load multiplier. In displacement control, the time step is exactly the load multiplier. All of this we said already in week seven, but it will become clearer and clearer as we go forward. This was another slide about like uh, time series, what are time series, but I don't think you guys need to recall that. What you need to remember is that it's something that you need to define every time that you're running an analysis, so before the analysis command. Um, and let's go exactly to the first type of integrator in static analysis that we have, the load control. So this is the only integrator that you can use in which you are the ones who define how the loads are incremented over time in your analysis. So the duration is the total duration of your analysis. If you have a linear time series, it's just a RAM, and you don't like put an additional multiplier to that RAM inside of the time series object, the duration will be exactly equal to the load factor increment. So let's just make an example. If I'm doing a gravity analysis, I want to see if my what's the response of my structure. If I double the, the, the weight that I put on it, I will just try to make a duration of two of an analysis with load factor one of the load pattern that I introduced in my analysis. How do you, when we use load control? We use for linear and nonlinear gravity analysis, and for example, for performing pushover analysis while we apply prescribed displacements. Of course, the control will be operated to all the load patterns defined before the analysis command, and this is true for any integrator. So if you define a load pattern after the analysis command, of course, uh, it will not be incremented by this kind of integrator. And it has to be active. So sometimes what we do is define many load patterns of different load combinations. And if we want to perform, for example, um, a combination in which we do not need uh, variable loads, we can apply a load factor of zero. So those, those load patterns will not be active and they will not uh, be controlled by the integrator. Then we have displacement control, which is the other major type of integrator in static analysis. The integrator decides how this is, is the integrator who decides how the loads are incremented over time. How the loads are incremented over time. Mm. So when you define 
uh, a display tool control analysis, and before you have input a load pattern, you know that it will get you will get an error if you don't input a time series in the load pattern as a reference, because any load pattern has to have a tag reference to, to a time series. But just so you know, in displacement control, that time series will not be used. What, what will define the time series is done by the integrator. So what you're defining is not uh, how the, the, the load will evolve over time. What you're defining is, exact, is actually a specific control node in your model, which is just one, uh, a specific degrees of freedom to be controlled of the node, of the node, sorry, um, which is based uh, one base. So you need to um, remember that direction one is X, direction two is uh, Y, uh, Z, and then rotation X, rotation uh, Y, and rotation Z. Then uh, you have to define what's the target displacement of your analysis, and that's actually what's going to define the duration, not the time series. But the analysis will stop at the displacement that you define as the last to be reached. Then you have to input like an option if you want the analysis to be cyclic or not. That's it. Um, of course, this analysis can also be used as the load control to make gravity analysis, this, this type of integrator. You can also use it to make static static analysis and pushover analysis with applied loads, not applied displacements. The cyclic options is something that is just in SDKO. You cannot really do it in OpenSys right away by yourself. You, I mean, you can do it, but what you need to do is to define, um, let's say, the load, define an, a different analysis for each cycle that you're trying to model. So it's a bit more um, complicated to, to implement. Then there's a parallel displacement control, which is exactly the same indicator, but it is um, it's written for uh, parallel computation in OpenSys. So there's like this other integrator objects in OpenSys, other integrator type in OpenSys that we can use to use OpenSys MP. What else is there uh, from in the world of integrator and static analysis? A lot more, but the only thing I'm gonna like tell you about today is the arc length control. Sorry for my drawings, they're not so good. But what happens is that like you can have different behaviors in, in your model that you're trying to capture. Like your curve could have a, could present some softening or could present a snap true in which the curves goes down and then up again, or snap back in which the curves comes back in terms of displacement and then up again. How do you capture this behavior? So I'm sure you know already, uh, if you're doing a load control analysis, the blue lines, uh, you'll be able to capture the curve, but then it will be hard to capture the post peak behavior. And that's not really difficult with displacement control. The solution of the problem is unique at each step of the analysis. And this is the same with the snap true. Here I, I can try to use load control and it can maybe try to reach this point, but of course the load control increases the load all the time. It's not gonna go down and help me capture this point. So with displacement control, which are the orange lines, we can actually manage to describe the whole uh, solution of our problem. But then if we have a snapback, that's actually a complicated uh, problem because for example, in this point, we will have uh, three, three solutions for the same time step. That will be really hard to be defined by the, by certainly, certainly by the displacement control. So what we can do is we can do the arc length control, which actually defines each time steps based on a, a circle uh, with a given uh, radius. And so it's a, it's a type of displacement control that which can be used to trace the snapback behaviors. This is what I can tell you today, okay? And then moving on to transient integrators, we will talk about two major uh, mm, types. There's so many other types. And of, of course, I'm not gonna go into the math of these two. And you can actually, there's so many references. This is just one reference that you can study if you want to know more about this kind of integrators um, and this kind of methods. So the first type is the central different integrator which is a method that is explicit, which means that the solution is derived by quantities that you know from the beginning of your model, of your analysis. 
And you can always find convergence with these kind of methods because you don't have to update the quantities that you're using throughout the duration of your analysis. These methods are not stable unconditionally, which means that there are some limitations to their stability. <laughs> it means that you have to define specific quantities to reference in order to use them. They are used when you have very strong nonlinearities, for example, contact problems or collapse or fracture problems. And like convergence is very difficult to reach due to the great instability of these problems, like think about the fractures. Um, the solution in, in one point will not be the same over time during the analysis. And so the solution is not conveniently found implicitly. It's better to use quantities that you know from the beginning. But the, the, the limitations are very strong. If you think about it, like an example that I wrote there that Massimo gave to me this morning, for civil structure, the critical time steps that you need to use to be able to implement an analysis with a central difference method that controls the stability of the method, and so you're sure that your solution is actually a good solution, is of the order of the microseconds. So let's say you will need too many steps to operate a normal dynamic analysis, for example, for an earthquake input. Uh, but this is done just for very short um, analysis, for example, a blast or an explosion analysis. Then there's another method, which is the numeric method, which is the mostly used in all uh, series structure modeling. Um, it's an implicit integration method, which means that convergence can be hard to find at times, so it cannot be used for very complex problems like contact problems that I talked about before. That's because it depends on quantities that vary at each time step. So uh, even the, the known variables of your problem, they are updated at each step. But it is unconditionally stable if you define it with certain parameters. The option that is mostly used is this one, the average acceleration method, which is unconditionally stable for the two parameters that you're asked to define also in STKO, which is gamma and beta, so 0 0.5 and 0 0.25. And if you use these parameters, you, you can be sure that your solution will be stable. So this is not something that is like just for open seas or SDKO. This is true for any numerical analysis. And these are the options that are available in open seas. There's so many other options, like for example, the HHT method and the TRBVF2 method, uh, which are used to model numerical dumping of higher frequencies, but I'm gonna, I'm, I cannot talk about this now. And also if you really need, uh, we can point you to some examples or, or to some specific um, references. But to be honest, like they're not really used for let's say uh, civil buildings modeling. Then we have the analyze command. So the analyze command is what actually makes you perform the analysis. Uh, you can use it with two options. You can define a fixed time step. So your duration uh, will be divided by the number of increments and the size of the time steps will always be the same. Or uh, you can define it with the adaptive time step. As I said at the beginning, this is something that we implemented in STKO. It's not available in OpenSys. In OpenSys, there's the transient variable and you can define a variable time steps with other parameters. Uh, in, this, in, this, in any way, they do the same thing. So they allow you to resize the time steps as the analysis proceed. And how, why it is that like interesting and important? This is because if you are just doing a fixed time step analysis, uh, what happens in case of non-convergence, the analysis will just stop. Uh, and you will, will have to kind of go back, resize your time step, and try again. And this is like, could be a never ending process. Instead with the adaptive time step, you can define some condition based on which um, the time steps will be resized, resized and the conversions of your analysis will be more easily found because at a point in which the analysis does not converge, um, the, the, the analysis command, so like the object, uh, the analysis object will go back in time and resize the step and try to move forward again. Our adaptive time step implementing STKO is an algorithm that tends to stabilize itself around the number of iterations defined in the converging test. So this means that for each, each um, time step resizing, it will try to do it 
not, not more that um, the number of times that you define your convergence test to iterate. So what happens? You try to move from T to the T. Your convergence test is telling you uh, this doesn't work. Let's try again. This doesn't work. Let's try again. So it means my tolerance is not satisfied. I try again. And the same number of times our algorithm tries to resize the step to find a better convergence. There's some parameters that you can input. Maximum and minimum factor. Maximum and minimum factor related to the increment. Of course, like just for you to understand how does it work inside your adaptive time step um, it's defined as the product of this factor for your initial time step so it's a proportion you start with a time step of one and then you either increase or decrease that 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 measure that size um, at each step that factor is also incremented because, of course, you have used a different factor at the previous time step to do the same operation to find the adaptive step, the adaptive time step. This factor depends on the desired number of iteration that you want and the number of iterations that you have already done previously in the analysis uh, at, the, at the previous step. So all of these to just uh, kind of make you understand how you can Mm, calibrate these factors if you want to change the way the adaptive time step works. There are some default factors. We never change them. So um, my suggestion is to use what is already there, which mostly works fine. But if you're having convergence problems, this can be something that you can try to, to see if you can actually find a better solution, especially if you're uh, working on uh, problems like what we talked about before, where there are snap through or snap back in your solution, or you expect them to be, of course. Then we got to the load cost. We talked about this already, especially in week seven with the time series. I'm sure you all remember what it does, but I'm sure there's also some, still some uh, uncertainties about it. So the command is used to set the load constant in the domain for the next analysis stage. And to reset the pseudo time, so you can, it has two functions. In fact, in STTO, when you click on the, on the option to keep the load constant, you have the option also to reset the pseudo, the pseudo time. Why do you want to reset the pseudo time to zero? This is because you want to reuse Hello? It. Hello? Hi. Sí, como te va? Me dejaste preocupado. ¿Qué pasó? Alex, you're not talking with us, I think. Let me try to mute you. Mm. I'm sorry. I don't know why I can't mute people. Let me try from here. One second. Oh yeah, he got muted by himself. Great. Let's try again. Um, so what I was saying is that why do you want to reset the pseudo time? Um, you want to reset the pseudo time because you either want to reuse your time series, which is really useful. I'm gonna make you an example for you to understand that. And of course you want to do that because if you're using displacement control or arc length, which is also a displacement control, the time steps is actually equal to the load multiplier. If we go back to our first um, slide, the glossary slide, Ooh, I think it was here, no, here. So I said that in displacement control, well, starting from the scratch, I said that the load multiplier is a function of time. But then in displacement control, this function is actually the actual time. So it means that the load multiplier is the time. So if we don't reset the time, uh, and for example, we started with a gravity analysis from zero to one, um, then we don't reset the time and we go forward with a pushover analysis, the load multiplier is the time. So this will mean that if my load was of 1000 kilonewton, the application of the load that 
will be uh, enforced in the pushover analysis will be done with a load multiplier of 1,000 kilonewton that I put at the beginning. So this does not matter if uh, my units are small and my loads are small. I would just start from a little jump forward. But then if I don't do this reset and my loads are very high, the ones that I've used in the previous step, for example, with load control, then I will have very much problems and the analysis will not converge and I will not understand why because it's not something that OpenSys signal you, signals you. So going back, um, as in other words, like it's like reusing the 100% of the load of the first stage as your first load multiplier in the second stage. This I repeated many times, so I hope it's clear. And then later we can see if everybody understood the concept. Um, of course, as for integrator, uh, for the load const is the same. So if you put a load pattern after your analysis command, they're not going to be invoked. Um, they're not going to be set to constant if they're invoked afterwards. And if you remove a load pattern and you would like to try and keep um, their effect constant, that cannot happen. So what you can do is just you reset the time step. You do not reapply the pattern, but you keep uh, the load pattern there. Uh, you don't remove it. And in this way, you can keep their effect constant and you're not reapplying the same load multiplier as before or the same load as before. This is a little example for you to understand the concept. I want to do a pushover analysis on this column. So first I do a gravity in one first stage, one second, and then I apply an horizontal force another second. If I do not want to reset the time steps, I will just do one analysis. I will have to do just one analysis and define different time series for my two load patterns, the horizontal load pattern and the vertical load pattern. At sorry, the Frances sorry, Francesca. In this case, the time series has to be different, but could be both linear, for example. You, you can see they're both linear. They're both applied linearly, the load. I applied the, it's, it's, a, it's a linear application, like linear and constant. Yeah, yeah, the, the, this I understand. But the thing is, if I don't want to reset the cell to time, so I have to make two. So once one is consumed, is uh, finished, the other one starts from scratch, from zero. You have to make two. One, the first one will start from zero, and the second one will start from the point you want it to start. So in this case, I want the first stage to be one second. So my second application will just start growing at one second. Okay. So this you will have to define a time series path and uh, define the duration of your analysis in the analysis command as two seconds because your time series is two seconds long. Okay. But then um let's say this way it's a bit complex think about it if you want to do something cyclic or if you you actually don't need to do all of this for just a simple such a simple thing so what you do is that you do not reset the time step you reset the time step you create two different analyses one after the other because in the in the previous example you had to add both of the load pattern before of the analysis command Instead, like this, you can just add them one after the other, like load pattern analysis, load pattern analysis. Of course, before I put the recorder and the boundary conditions and define your analysis as anyway, uh, one second long because each load application is one second long and they will reuse, oh, sorry, the same time, the same time series. They will use the same linear time series. Of course, if you click the lot const, this uh, load of the vertical analysis will be kept constant until the end of the analysis. Okay, is it, is it clear? Yeah, okay. Then lastly, wipe analysis. So what do we need wipe analysis for? We already discussed this, but just to refresh. Wipe analysis is a command that does not destroy elements, nodes and material in your model, it just destroys the analysis setup. So it, re it resets it. Um, in SDKO, 
that thing that we put there is not so important and to be honest is not so useful because every time you redefine an analysis in SQL, you're like reapplying each of the settings. If you're writing your tickle script, you could also not uh, need to do that. If you had already defined uh, the constraint handler of your model and you are doing two analysis stages in OpenSeas, you're not, you do not need to rewrite constraint handler plain constraints, for example, because you had already defined it before. But of course, for how the SDKO interface works, you kind of need to do it, even if it's a bit redundant. So what happens is that every time you redefine something, what's coming before, it will be, it will be wiped. So you do not really need to use the wipe analysis command. We put it there for consistency with OpenSea's uh, commands, but then there's some cases in which you really should not use it. If you're doing an again value analysis and you're putting it after the analysis command exactly to enforce a specific constraint handler on your model. So to be sure that you are um, building your, your matrix in the way that you want, then if you wipe it, that the, the, the eigen analysis will reference the default setup of an analysis in SDKO and OpenSeas. And that setup, you don't know which one is it, first. And second, um, you cannot control uh, if it's the right one for your model. So any type of analysis you want to do, you have to anyway define first an analysis command with all the information, algorithm, uh, integrator, convergence test, etc. And that's it. So I actually was faster than I expected. Um, thank you guys for following. I'm not sure if it, everything was clear. If you have any questions, please do ask. If there was someone coming in late that if you want, I can go back at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, we do have a little bit of time to do that. I have a question. Go uh, if you can, if you can go back to the, um, when we explain the displacement control and we have these parameters we, we should define. Yes. Uh, so because I got a bit, I think I understood it, but I got a bit lost between the uh, actual, wait, wait I'm, I'm, I'm opening the dialogue of uh, Stikio. Because we define an, um, it, uh, Iteration, uh, sorry, sorry, iteration uh, value for uh, the test, but then when the analysis is with a, an adaptive time step, we also add a number of uh, of increments. Okay, so what happens is that I'll tell you how this works. So, like. no, because I got lost because at one point you uh, you speak about two different yeah. uh, iterations. And I didn't write it down, and now I'm. Um... Yeah, yeah, don't worry. So, what happened is that um, you want to do a displacement. This actually doesn't change anything with the concept I want to explain. Uh, I wanted to explain. So, whatever it is you're doing, load control, displacement okay. control, it has to do with the analyze command and with the type of time steps you want to use. So, if you're trying to, to use the adaptive time step uh, automatism that we have in SDKO, what will happen is that you will define a number of increments that you wish that your analysis will divide the duration into. So you want 10 steps. But then those 10 steps could be readapted. So for each of those steps, there could be a resized operation of that step if there is a non convergence problem or if the norm is too high and we want to bring it smaller norm of the convergence test, which is, is what actually defines the convergence of each step. So what happens here is that if I go back to the, how this was just a, a, an something to try to explain to you 
how this uh, size of the step is, re is redefined inside of the analysis. The algorithm of the adaptive time steps tends to stabilize um, around the number of iterations defining the convergent test. And this is because uh, like whenever you're trying to uh, solve a problem iteratively, you need to find uh, a point of solution that you want to converge to and, uh, and a range around that point. So the user defines that he wants to, to try the test a hundred times because the, the convergence is really hard to find. And so that number is the number that the adaptive time step uh, functionality uses to reiterate on the resize too, because it's a bit of the same things. I want to check the convergence, it doesn't work. So I will resize my step. It, it would not make any sense to uh, resize the steps more time than the convergence test uh, is set as iterations, neither less times, like, because it's as if it, it's anyway, both are attempts to convergence, no? Um, on, on the first, I'm gonna check if I'm converging or not with my test. And then I attempt again with different iterations. If I have a fixed time step type, I will just retry doing the same things. I will reapply my load or uh, remove my displacement forward of that time step that I had defined. That's it, that's fixed. If I'm in an adaptive uh, time step type, I will try to resize the time steps at each uh, reiteration of the tolerance of the convergence test. And so these two things are not related to each other. The convergence test has nothing to do with the adaptive time step. It's just that they are gonna move forward roughly the same amount of time. Of course, uh, you're trying to stabilize the algorithm. So it could happen that you're gonna reiterate a little bit more or a little bit less than that number of iteration. But that's, let's say, the number of times that resizing would happen. So for example, don't like, um, be surprised if you put uh, tolerance with the number of iteration of 1,000 and then it takes ages because the resizing is anyway a compass operation to, to do. So it will take a long time for your analysis to move forward because it will try more and more, especially with complex problems, to find a different, a different uh, size of the step to attempt that convergence. And this is you that tells that it's not, um, it's not something that it's embedded inside. So that number is important because it also uh, kind of guides the, the adaptive time steps resizing. So it could, it, do ha it could happen that uh, if we have an error of convergence is because this uh, number of increments is too low and we should increase it? No, no, what, no, what? The error of convergence is anyway tested by the convergence test. It's not tested by the time step. The time step resizing is just like, think about it in a curve, no? Um, like I'm here and I want to go further uh, and I'm in displacement control. And if I go of a lar too large time step, for example, like all of this, then my solution cannot do this curve by itself. And for some, for some it, it could take the wrong solution for a bifurcation problem, or it could not even find this point because the step is too large. So I'll try to move forward with the smaller step. Or let's say another example, I'm doing a lot of control and this is not true. I'm in adaptive time step. I am here, I'm trying to move forward, but of course the load control cannot go down because I'm always increasing the amount of loads I have. With the adaptive time step, what can happen is not always going to happen, but it, it could happen that the adaptive time step will resize my step as much as necessary to reach a solution that it's here. Um, so it's not that the time step is a solution to the convergence problem, it's not a reason for it. Okay, do you guys have 
Any more questions? We were really faster than expected. Mm. If I can, and if you guys wish to answer, I don't know, I know about Larissa, but I don't know about the others. Do you, would you like to share what is it that you're doing in SDK on OpenSeas so that we can also, like since from September, we're going to talk about a practical, a practical examples. So um, if you want to specify what is it that you're interested to learn as practical examples, because we do, we will talk about frame structures so I'm not going to go into solid elements or shell elements. Yeah, maybe some shells to model slabs, but or horizontal diaphragms. But anyway, um, if you guys have any specific request, I know Larissa has an equivalent frame modeling request. And also I think Enrique talked to me about masonry modeling. But if there's someone else that has, uh, I don't know, if you are interested in, in modeling infill or RC joints, something specific. No specific requests. This is your, you can talk. <laughs> This is like you and me here. Yeah. <laughs> you and me and Enrique. <laughs> and Mariana also. <laughs> so, well, if you don't have any more questions, if you don't have any requests on the theory, and if, will you guys be here next week? Yes. Okay. Because it's like, <laughs> I don't know, it's like the 4th of August in Italy is like nobody is working. So uh, <laughs> we will be working the first week of August and we'll do our webinar. Yeah, Mariana is there, so good. At least there's three of us. And well, thank you for participating. If you have any questions, you can use our forum all the time. We always answer even to the most difficult or the most boring questions. Uh, remind them, yeah, time next week is 6 p.m., not 5.30 p.m., uh, Italian time, always. And, yep, that's it. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. Next week. See you. Bye. Thank you.